I want to just share with you from the scriptures how I believe the Lord Jesus opened to me the scriptures. Because God will not hear us. It's if we come in with unclean hands and impure hearts, they're smarter in the medical field. They do not rush in in a panic. When it's serious, they make sure every germ in the room is gone. They make every effort. God didn't even send Isaiah out. He didn't even ask who will go until he had touched Isaiah's lips with the coal on the altar. Then he asked. I, I'm sure Isaiah would have volunteered before that. But when God sent the Savior to the world, he sent a man without sin who knew no sin. And the reason he was able to do that is he never sinned. He was pure and completely broken and submitted. And there is an area where I saw in my life, and I see it in the lives of very serious brothers, like you and I, that are much of our seeking and crying out leads to judgments and fights. So by the Lord's grace, I just want to take you through what I believe, how he opened up the scriptures to me, granting me repentance from this. Turn with me in Romans chapter 14. Just going to take us through it just like he did with me. Romans chapter 14, verse 1. Now the one being weak in faith received, but not unto this doubtful disputations. This word, this, this disputation, what it means is to separate thoroughly. You know, when you make an incision, you're cutting something open. When you make a decision inside, you're still, you're still cutting two things and and, and putting apart. And this same word, diacrino, is found in Acts chapter 15. If you want to go there, in Acts chapter 15, verse 9, where Peter is relating about when the Gentiles received the Holy Spirit. And he said, God, who knows hearts, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit in the very same way he gave to us. But he put no difference between us and them. That's the same word. This, these doubtful disputations happen when we put a difference between a devout brother and God is putting no difference there. We create a situation. And what it leads to is he goes on to say in, there in, in Romans you know, one, eat, one eats, one does not eat. Well, the one eating is in danger of despising. All it really means is make light of. Make light of the one who doesn't eat. And the one who doesn't eat, he's in danger of judging, making a separation, making a difference between the one that, that does, that, uh, that is eating these things. And, it's, and it says... But I want to read the verse, the one eating, uh, the one not eating, let not despise. And the one not eating, the one eating, let him not judge, for God has already received him. You know what I saw? The Lord showed me. The Lord immediately took me to the parable of the prodigal son. But it's not about the prodigal son. The parable was supposed to be about the elder brother. After the father was already hugging and kissing the son, the older brother is outside asking questions. He still got questions about who this person is. is. What did he do to your name? What has he been doing to your kingdom? Who was he with? How, how can you be in there celebrating? He, and it's the imperfect tense in the Greek. He's continually outside asking questions 
when the Father has already received them. And if we have that kind of attitude in our heart, we can cry out from now to forever and we will not be hurt. None of us, in verse 7 of this chapter, it says none of us lives to himself alone. None of us dies to himself alone. Whether we live, we live to the Lord. Whether we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or die, we are the Lord. For this reason, Christ died. It was made Lord of both the dead and the living. So then you, why do you discriminate between your brother? Why do you put a difference between you and your brother? Or why do you, why do you make light of your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. It's written, as I live, says the Lord, to me every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us, we will give an account of ourselves to God. Okay, stop. Therefore, no longer, never again, put a difference between you and your brother. There is a difference between our brothers and the world. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brothers. But in the family and among the brothers, we should not be putting a difference where God our Father has not. Amen. 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 And it says, therefore, no longer, never again. He that has suffered in his flesh has ceased from sin, and it's time we arm ourselves with this attitude. I will not put a difference between my brother whom my Lord has received. Because what that does is that puts a stumbling block in front of them. It's what that does. You know what this looks like? What does this look like? How do you recognize whether this is happening? Turn with me to 3 John. This is where the Lord took me next. Uh, I want to say where I believe the Lord took me next. That word is so thrown around nowadays. 3 John. You remember him? There's a name in 1 John. He's famous for all the wrong reasons. His name is Diotrephes. Verse 9, I wrote to the church, but the one loving the preeminence, Diotrephes. How do you know he's loving preeminence? Because John says he does not receive us. And he doesn't receive the brothers. And those, who, those, those in the church who want to receive the brothers, he hinders them. Now, what's he doing to hinder these brothers? Well, the key is, is in receives. Receives here is the Greek word epidekomai. It means he's not fully welcoming. And the key is epi. Yeah, are we that way? He's a sweet brother, but yeah, they've got a neat church over there. But oh yeah, he's a believer, sincere. But. So it says, John says, verse 10. So on account of this, if I come, I will call to mind the works which he does. Now, what are the works which he does? Do you see it there? What, what works does he do? do? He, he's slandering us with evil words. The word here for evil, poneros, it, it's, it's a word that ha talks about the effect. The effect of his words have an evil effect. You know what, you know what evil uh, words really are? They're any words that are unwholesome. Brothers and sisters, let no unwholesome talk proceed forth out of your mouth, but only what is good for the edification of the hearer and that ministers grace. I'm not really interested in the detail of the word. I want to know its effect. What effect is the word having on the hair? And you know what the word is used for slandering? It, it's the Greek word fluorone. And it, it's, it means uh, to bubble up or to boil over. And let me show you a place where, it, where it's used in the New Testament. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5. This is used of women. Young, young widows, actually. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 13. 
But hold on, ladies, you're going to get you some big relief here. This idea that gossip has to do with, uh, with uh, women is about to be shot down. Uh, here it says that <clears throat> these young widows, it, he refused to put them on the list there in verse 11, he says, because, you know, if, if, when they grow wanted against Christ, they desire to marry and they, they, uh, they incur judgment because they've broken their first pledge, first pledge. And then he says, verse 13, and besides, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but also gossips. That's the word here, gossips. Busybody saying things they ought not. Now, what do you think a young widow who's going from this house to this house to this house and this house and bubbling over with information is saying that she ought not? How about just comparing this house to this house? Well, they do it this way. Well, they do it this way. Well, they do it this way. Those who compare themselves among themselves are not wise. And this is what Diotrephes is doing. He's just not fully receiving the brothers. But, and here's this, there's something a little bit more about evil speaking than just content. It's not just the details and what a person is saying. It's the direction. They're speaking from. Look with me in James chapter 4. This is something that I wish I would have had a godly brother come alongside and slap me upside the head and show me this. But let a righteous man smite me. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a speaking that says a piercing of a sword, isn't there? And I, it's going to take the rest of my life. For the, for the <coughs> reputation of my repentance to outpace the damage my own tongue has done. Mm. I'm being honest here. Here in James chapter 4, do you see it? Verse 11. What, what's the direction that is wrong regardless of the, of the factual accuracy of the detail? What direction is it? It's against. Do not speak of. Against. You know this same word kata lalaite? It means kata laleo to speak against. In 1 Peter chapter 2, it's called evil speaking. That's how it's translated. And it says, put away all evil speaking and malice and slander and envy and clamor of every kind and then crave the pure spirit. Is you mix the pure spiritual milk of the word with this kind of evil speaking against another. And here, here's, here's the thing, too, about this word, another brother. There's two words for other in the Greek. There's alos, another of the same kind, and eteros, another of a different kind. Here it's another brother. What kind do you think it is? Here, what word do you think? It's alos or eteros here? What do you think? It's alos. Do not speak against another brother of the same kind. Because he says, if you speak against your brother, you are speaking against the law and judging the law. And if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law. You are a critic. A, that's the idea. You're a critic of the law. You're a judge of the law. And there is only one lawgiver who is able both to save and destroy. But who, who are you to criticize or judge or evaluate or discriminate against your brother? Who are you? What would cause a person to be able to think he has the ability to do this? To put a difference where God places no. What would, cause, what would cause a person to be able to think to do this? Wouldn't it be that he thought he had the ability to do so? Where does that come from? Look with me. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, and see, Paul warned this. Where does this come from, this tendency that we fall too easily into? 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 
Now Paul says, now concerning things uh, offered idols, we, we know that we all have knowledge, but what does knowledge do, y'all? It puffs up, but love edifies. And if anyone thinks he sees his idol to perceive, he does not get agnosco. He does not, he does not know by experience. If anyone thinks I can see clearly, he does not yet experientially know as he ought. You know, both of these words, I know and know, or in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 2, if I have the gift of prophecy, and I can perceive, I know all mysteries, and I have all knowledge, gnosko, but I have not love, I am nothing. You want an example of someone who has, who could perceive all mysteries and have all knowledge, but did not have love? His name was Solomon. The, the, the perception and the knowledge he had really came into great use when he built temples to Molech and Chemosh and Ashtoreth without love. Because his, his wives turned his heart away from the Lord and his heart was not fully devoted unto God as it was before. But he still had his perception and his knowledge well enough. It's not surprising. Didn't Jesus say? Well, before I go there, but it says knowledge puffs up, love edifies. It's, it's, it, if you think you see and you think you know, you do not know as you ought, but it says, but if anyone loves God, this one has been known of him. So what does it take to be known of God? To be loving. Now think about this. If you don't have love, but you have ability, perception, and knowledge, you can build big churches. What do you think these guys are building them with? They know how it works. They've got perception into the human personality. They've got knowledge of what people want. Do you, you know what they're missing? Love. And that's why the Lord can say, It's easy to talk about them. Let's talk about us. The church of Ephesus. You know, you can test false apostles. You're enduring hardship for my name. You're doing more now than you were at first. But I have this against you. You have left. It's not lost. You have left your first love. And knowledge without love is you can know about revival. But if you're praying outside of the baptism of the love of Christ, watch out what you might be able to do with that in a group of people. It's a dangerous thing. Look in uh, uh, Col uh, Colossians. You know, where does it... Uh, <clears throat> Colossians chapter 2, as you're turning there, knowledge puffs up. <coughs> Fusioi, puffs up. What, what part of us does knowledge puff up? Where does it puff up? We need to understand this. Yeah. Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, verse 16. Now let's verse 18. Let no one rule against you, desiring to do so in false humility in the worship of angels, Intruding into things which what? Isn't that interesting? What's the intruding into things he has not seen? Vainly being puffed up where? Where is he puffed up? In his carnal mind. What do you think the carnal mind is puffed up with? Knowledge. It's interesting. It's knowledge that he has not seen how can that be? How can, you, how can you have knowledge that you have not seen? Here's a way. Jesus says the son does nothing but what he sees the father doing. If you're only doing what your carnal insight has given you the ability to see without the spirit of God, it will puff you up 
And what it leads to is that what it warns about in verse 18, let no one rule against you. You know what the word is umpire and referee. You know what umpires and referees are? They are the guys who are rule experts. They're, they can't even play the game themselves sometimes. They are, they're, the guys on the field are professionals, but they're experts in the rules. And what it says here is net, let, none of these, let none of these people who were puffed up in their carnal mind making differences between people rule against you, disqualifying you for the prize. There is one rule among brothers of the same kind. And Paul in this very same book said, because, you know, an umpire, there's one rule that must rule because an umpire and a referee really comes in handy when two people see something from a different perspective. The umpire has to make the decision. You know what the umpire is supposed to be for brothers of the same kind, the body of Christ? Let the peace of Christ rule. As members of one body, we were called to peace. And if that's not what's making the ruling, watch out to see if it's not some zealous, carnal, puffed up man and who's lost connection from the head. Because you know how the head, you know how someone's connected from the head? The whole body gets joined together, not separated into different parts. That's how you can tell. And you want to see this, another picture of this carnal mind at work? Turn with me to uh, 1 Corinthians. Paul mentions this in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. This was the problem in the Corinthian church. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Let's just take verse 6 and 7. Now these things, brothers, I've transformed to myself and Apollos because of you in order that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written. Puffed up in behalf of one, kata against the other. And here, guess what other is? Because see, when you are against someone, you have to make them the other of a different kind. Then you can be against them because you are doing the work of God. And here, you get Apollos and Paul. It, we are warned, and there's a grave warning for us here, and I want it, it's here in the verse, if you could see it in the original language, it's beautiful. Not to think beyond what is written. Actually, in the original, it's not beyond what is written to think. Who pair what is written to think. Normally, when who pair and to think is put together, who pair think to think above, it's translated pride. The only thing separating it here is the word it is written. Everywhere else in the New Testament, when you begin to think above what God thinks, he calls it pride. And when you, when you place a difference where God has placed no difference, you are puffed up in your carnal mind and you are proud. And you're not operating in the spirit. That's why verse, said, verse 7 says, for who makes you to put a difference? See, if you, diacrino, the same word in Acts 15, 9, right here. Who makes you to put a difference? If God has not put a difference between brothers of the same kind, he has not point, given you the assignment either. I know. Ask me how I know. Ask me how many times I've repented of that. Lord, is that some more ashes becoming beauty? I hope so. Back up with me also in 1 Corinthians 3. This, he puts it this way. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, brothers, verse 1. I, I was not able to, to speak to you as to a spiritual people, but to a carnal, as to babes in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, because you were not able. Indeed, you're still not able because you are carnal. You know, what? you know how you know you're carnal as a church? That there is divisions among you. 
Size. Size. You can't have size unless someone has been putting a difference between people of the same kind. That's how you make sides. For where there are envy and see strife, the reason I'm calling it strife because I understand the Greek word. It just means sides. You see down in, um, oh, I'll point that out in a minute, but it's clear division is you stand apart. You know, I, I, that's literally what the word means. If there are sides that are standing apart, you are carnal. You see, that's the difference between a holy man of God and a Pharisee. I know. I was a Pharisee. I can say like Paul. I tasted the Pharisee. I walked as a Pharisee. I was a Pharisee, a Pharisee. Here's the difference between a man holy, he is set apart unto God, and a Pharisee is a separated one from men. I spent enough time separating myself from men because I placed a difference where God had placed no difference. It was not holiness unto the Lord. It was my own carnal mind puffed up creating divisions. And the Spirit of God was not with me, and he was not hearing me. And here, all they said, here's the thing, I am of someone other than Christ. And here, they only had one person between them and Christ. Think about that. He called it carnal, just saying, I am of. Think about what you hear now. How long is the spiritual pedigree we give now? Well, you know, I came from and from and he came from and he was a disciple of. And it's carnal just to have any one man. You think Jesus said for no reason, call no Man, Father. Isn't that what it means to be of someone? We're not to do that. I told you that the word strife it means sides. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm sorry. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10. Excuse me. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10. When we're putting differentiations between brothers, we're creating sides. I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, to think what? Or to speak what? The same. You see it? The same. To speak the same. All speak the same. That there be no divisions, but that you be completely restored in the same mind and the same purpose. You can't have the same mind, the same purpose, and think the same when you are putting differentiations where God has placed none. And it says that there be no divisions. Here is the word schism. You know where schisms begin. They begin with isms. And I just recommend it for the body of Christ, just from a, a brother to plead, forsake all isms. Forsake them. Why describe yourself with an ism of any kind? It's only going to produce a schism. That's all it's going to produce. And he goes on down to say in verse 12, Now I say this, that each one of you says, I'm of Paul, and I'm of Paulos, or I'm of Cephas, and I'm of Christ. He asked in verse 13, Has Christ been divided? The, the word for uh, their, for fights um, is eridase. The word for divided is meridase. The only difference is one letter, M. M is, M is in the division. The meridian, you've heard of the, the prime meridian, comes from this Greek word, meridice. Eridice is just, uh, eridice is like a contest. You know, it takes, two can't walk together except they be degree. We already know that, but they're also, so, two can't fight together except they be disagree. It takes two to quarrel. And you must have a division if you're going to have a contest. And a contest take contest stunts. And you're contesting against each other. But Christ has not been divided. This word for meridian was used in the Septuagint over and over and over again is what they did with the spoils after they won a battle. You want to see that in the New Testament? Turn to Colossians chapter 2 real quick. Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. Paul's trying to spare them. It's already going on in the church. And he says, be, well, let's read verse 6. 
As therefore you see Christ Jesus as the Lord, so walk ye in him. Not an ism. Having been rooted and being built up in him, being established in the faith, just as you were taught and abounding in it with thanksgiving. And be where lest anyone will be capturing you. Capturing you literally means from the Greek word to carry you off as a prize after battle. That's the result of schisms in the church. People wanting to boast in their fleshly mind that you agree with them. And it's a carnal work. It is not a work of the Spirit. I want you to notice something. There's going to be there's a key here that Paul begins to try to make clear to those he's writing. Paul was such a man of God. He had such wisdom. I just want to understand what he's trying to warn us about. In verse 8, beware lest anyone will be capturing you through this love of wisdom and this empty deceit. You know what empty, another word for empty deceit is? Puffed up knowledge. Vain. Worthless. But what is it according? What is this love of philosophy and this empty deceit according to? It's according to the tradition of men. It's always going to come from men. And Paul is going to begin to do something. And we're going to, I'm going to ask you to turn to Titus. And you're going to see what this tradition of men begin to look like. And he's going to begin to make a contrast. You know, that's how we know things. We know things by comparing them. Hot only has meaning because you understand what cold is. Rest only has meaning because you understand what it means to be worn out. Good only has meaning because you are contrasting it and comparing it to evil. So the work of man producing these differences and divisions and schisms, putting differences where God has not put them, is set in contrast to the work of the Spirit. Watch that and see. Look in Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3, verse 8. Let's start there. Faithful is the word, and concerning these things I want you to strongly affirm so that you may take thought unto good works, to maintain good works for those who having believed in God. These things are good and profitable to men, but foolish speculations or disputes and genealogies and strifes and legal quarrels avoid. They are unprofitable and useless. So you see, some things he just said were good and profitable to all. These things that come from men, these foolish speculations, these genealogies, these strifes, and these legal battles, they are what men are doing. They're not good and profitable. They're unprofitable and useless. I want you to strongly affirm the things that are good and profitable to all. What were those? They're back at the first of the chapter. Chapter 3, verse 1. Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient to every ready, unto every good work, and to do what? To blaspheme no man. You ever seen that before? We know a lot about blaspheming the Holy Spirit. We're not supposed to do that. The scripture said we're not supposed to blaspheme another man. That just means injure with your speech is what that means. You're not to blaspheme and you are to be uncontentious. No brawler, I believe it says in the King James. You are to be gentle. This word gentle is intensive. It has the, the Greek intensifier, a P in front of it, and ikes, a P ikes. Ike means to yield. It means faint. It means pliable. So to be fully pliable. It, this is what Paul uses in, in, in Philippians chapter 4. And let your forbearing spirit be made known to all men. And here it's let, let your fully forbearing 
Spirit be made known to all men. It's also used in the passage, wisdom from above is first of all pure, then peaceable, and then this word, yielded, fully yielded. It's going to take the rest of my life for my zealous, carnal Phariseeism and those that knew me. It's going to take the rest of my life for my walk of repentance for my forbearing spirit to become known to all. <coughs> I, there, there's skeptics out there. Some of them may be watching me right now on, on streaming that knew me and do not want anything to cry with to do with Christ because of me. Blaspheme no one. Be completely uncontentious to be fully gentle, demonstrating all meekness to all men. Where do you get these qualities from? Only the Holy Spirit. You'll never get these from traditions of men. This is no working according to men. Look at just, just real quick, a, a quick purveyance, please, of the these back in the third chapter, verse uh, nine, these things that come from men. I do not want to spend too much time in them, but I do want to just touch upon them. The Holy Spirit forbade me to go into detail on these. I felt a check to do that. But I wanted you to understand how to recognize them. The first in verse nine, we are that are that are completely unprofitable and, fu and futile are foolish disputes. The Greek word for foolish is moros. And the Greek word for disputes is, is a pasis. It, it, it really means seekings in its most literal translation. And what it, I searched for, what's the best English word for this? And I came up with it. At least it works for me. It's fixation. These, these morose fixations. And what a fixation is something that a person becomes so focused about and so consumed about and so thinking about that it becomes his issue. Because it's always what is issuing out of him upon others. And you know it's a fixation because he's going around trying to fix others with his issue. And it, what it produces is a morose dispute. Morose is the, it's the same Greek word where it says, if the salt has become morose. If it's lost its savor. It, one of the better ways to translate it in English is insipid. It's dull. It's without life. It's without vitality. It's meaningless. It's powerless. It doesn't attract anyone's attention. It, it doesn't make anyone thirsty. And the other place it's used in a very dangerous way is that there were ten virgins. Five were morose. And five were wise. But they were virgins waiting for the Lord, expecting him to come. And can you see five virgins without the Holy Spirit and full of the doctrines of men waiting for Christ? And they don't discover it till the hour when they need light. So what do they do when they need light and they have no oil? They do what, where they got all the rest of their information from. They turn to men and they ask it from them. And they, at this time they say, no. Go get it on your own. Serious, serious things. Beware of men fixated on issues that only cause to, to put differences between brothers of the same kind. And the other thing is genealogies. We touched upon that. You know what a genealogy is? It's a study of origins. I thought that's simple. I am of Christ. I was born from above. God is my father. Christ is my brother. Where's my pedigree? That's it. I've got a lot of brothers and sisters. It's a large family. That's the only thing I'm concerned about. Us, when it's a brother of the same kind. Be careful. We've talked about strife. Strife. For, to, to have strife, you must have a contest. To have contest, you must have contestants. To have contestants, you must have two sides against each other. From men. It's not a work of the Spirit. You know how? 
all the work of the Spirit is in accordance with the will of God. And it was his will to bring all things unto one. He destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. Because his purpose was to make in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace. And sides don't make peace. Men putting differences where they are not placed by God make sides. And it's an unprofitable and useless procedure. And the Holy Spirit is not in it. Regardless of the amount of zeal and passion you might be witnessing in the person speaking. There are and the last thing is, uh, I'll touch upon a little more, it's legal fight. I want to say that for a moment. I'm going to talk more about what that is in a minute. But I want you to notice in verse 10. Who, who is it that we are to reject? Verse 10. But a heretic reject after the first and second admonition, knowing that, he's, that such a person has been perverted, sinning. They're self-condemned. Do you know what a heretic means? Does anyone explain what a heretic is? The word heretic comes from the Greek word hereto, to choose. Here's, who, here's what a heretic is. He's a person asking you to choose sides when God has not. And what does it say to do to him? After the first or second admonition, you try to admonish him. Then it says reject. You know, what, you know what reject means? All it means is please excuse yourself. That's all it means. Same word when they, they used when uh, the, the king sent out his servants to go invite people for the banquet. They said, may I please be excused? But when I find a person that's just trying to make Christian brothers choose a side, I just excuse myself after the second time. I'm not to quarrel. Look what it says. It uh, 2 Timothy. See, this, this same stuff is in 2 Timothy. Look real quick. 2 Timothy. Chapter 2. Same, same thing. The same comparison and contrast are right here in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Uh, verse 22. But youthful lust flee and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with the ones calling on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned disputes, the same word, these foolish and unlearned fixations, excuse yourself, Timothy, knowing, here's what they bring forth, fights. Not only are they completely unprofitable and they're useless, they bring forth fights. And a bondservant of the Lord must not fight. He must be kind to all. Skillful at teaching. And he must forbear evil. That's really what the word is. He must be able to bear with evil. A bond servant of the Lord needs to learn how to do this. In meekness, instructing the ones that oppose themselves, if perhaps that God may grant them repentance and lead them unto a full knowledge of the truth, that they may regain their senses and escape out of the snare of the devil, having been taken captive to do the will of that one. And you know what the will of that one is and why it's so important that a bondservant of the Lord not, must not strive, he must not fight, he must, he must in meekness instruct those because the, the, the work of the evil one is the accusation of the brethren. And a bondservant of the Lord must learn how when, when someone has been taken captive and he's coming against one of the Lord's brothers and he must deal with it skillfully and not fight. When it's another brother of the same kind. Now I mentioned that these legal battles, I didn't cover that, but I want to cover it now in 1 Timothy chapter 1. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, 
Legal battles are particularly difficult to deal with. And, and I believe by the grace of God, you're going to see what I was shown by our Lord. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, let's start with verse 3. Just as I urged you to remain in Ephesus, traveling into Macedonia, that you should command certain ones not to teach differently. Eteros. Look, our teaching should not lead to making differences. nor to pay attention to myths, genie, and you know what myths are? They're sayings. You know what a saying is? You know what a myth is? A myth is something made up in the mind of man that didn't come from the Holy Spirit. That's all it is. And it can have the Lord told me all over it. Jesus told me. Jesus showed me. The carnal mind is puffed up with all kinds of things it hasn't seen. It's a myth if it's not the work of the Spirit. To bring men unto Christ. Beware. Nor to pay attention to myths or uh, endless genealogies. Wait, what do they cause? Disputes. These same fixations. Rather than the edification of God the one by faith. Now follow here in verse 5. What is the end of the commandment? What's the goal of the commandment? Love out of a pure heart and a good conscience. And a faith without hypocrisy or a sincere faith. But some, certain ones, having strayed from this, have turned aside unto meaningless talk. And look what they're wanting to be teachers of. Law. They want to be teachers of the law, not understanding neither the things they say nor what things they confidently affirm. Here's the difficulty when you get into someone that is, wants to be a teacher of the law, but he is not full of the Holy Spirit. Turn with me in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. You'll see this. You know, before you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, let's go to Romans. Let's do this. I think it would be better in this order. Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, verse 1. Brother, the good pleasure of my heart and the supp my supplication with God on behalf of Israel is, for, is unto their salvation. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but it's not according to full knowledge, epigenosko. It's not complete. It's for not fully knowing God or no, I should say, for not knowing the righteousness of God, what do they seek to establish, y'all? Righteousness. Their own righteousness. But what was their righteousness based on? The law. The man who does these things shall live by them. That is a dangerous person with a zeal for God, but not according to a complete knowledge, seeking to establish righteousness. That. A dangerous person. You know why? It is the perfect instrument for Satan to keep a person from seeing the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. You want to see that? Now I'll turn to 2 Corinthians and you'll see that. 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. Chapter 11. Verse 12, what I'm doing, I'm going to continue to do that I may cut off the opportunity of those who are desiring to boast that they may be found just as we are. For such ones are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves unto apostles of Christ. And no wonder. For Satan himself transforms into an angel of light. Is it no great thing then if his ministers transform themselves as to ministers of righteousness? What is it, y'all, that remains over the heart to this day when the law is read? A veil. What, what does the veil represent? 
The veil represents anything that keeps a man from seeing the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And the most effective person to do this is a, someone puffed up in their carnal mind seeking to establish righteousness because they don't fully know the righteousness of God. I was one of these persons. And I was shown mercy just like the Apostle Paul because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. I was like the Galatians. After having begun in the spirit, I sought to be made perfect in the flesh. I fell from a great height. Christ Jesus literally became to me of none effect. I don't know what your theology is. All I know is my wife knew Christ Jesus was none effect to me. My children knew Christ Jesus was none effect to me. Those I work with knew Christ Jesus was none effect to me. The only person who didn't know Christ Jesus had become none effect to me was me. But by the mercy of God, when I had finished nearly burning every bridge in my zeal, and you know, you know that there's, a, there's something behind contention when the Bible says, contention cometh but by what? Pride. When, when my pride had finished running, no, overcoming most of my opponents, because you know, after all, I was this, I was an expert at making a difference between other Christians. And, but it, they, eventually, uh, they eventually got tired of persecuting me for righteousness. That's how I figured. They couldn't handle the truth. And they, I eventually wore them out, and I found myself quite alone. Then I realized I had problems still, and it wasn't them. And all my knowledge began to work at something. I mean, I was a devout student of the word. But I found myself in the place where Paul was. How is it that I keep doing what I hate to do if I do what I don't want to do? Oh, wretched man that I am. And, and it, it's when I came to that place, I saw a revelation. Who shall deliver me from this body of death? And I was restored to Jesus Christ again. And then this wonderful repentance. I think a far greater salvation than my first one. I, I'm not trying to be, well, I just, that's why I see it. I'm being saved. I am, I still want to be saved. He came to save me from sin. If there's a single sin in my life, I want to be saved. I just want to be saved to the uttermost. He's able to save to the uttermost. And it's, I don't think he's finished with me yet. Now, the lawyers are always the ones that have a difficult time with this. Now, if you're still in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, turn back to the first part of the chapter. And, and, and may the grace of our Lord expose, at this, our, the last bit of our time here together, may he expose one of the, the most pervasive and effective strategies that Satan has ever come up with. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Oh, that you would bear with me a little in the foolishness, my foolishness. And indeed, you do bear with me. For I'm zealous of you with a godly zeal because I betroth you unto one husband as a pure virgin to present you to Christ. But I'm afraid, lest perhaps as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so... Your minds may be corrupted away from the simplicity that is in Christ. Satan is crafty. He's, this word crafty means all working. He's able to work it all out. He's able to make it seem so right. But if you were going to corrupt, because corrupt means to ruin or spoil. And the word simplicity it actually comes from the Latin. Simplex means to be without a fold. Complex means to be with a fold. It, this is the same word for if your eye be single. A plus in the Greek. If your eye be single, what is it? Your whole body is full of light. But if the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? But here, here it's supposed to be single, simple, simple. The simplicity of Christ. So if you 
wanted to ruin and spoil simplicity, how would you do it? Complicated. complicate the simplicity of devotion to Christ. The lawyers, when you think of complicating matters, lawyer, that's their specialty. Lawyers are experts at complicating things. Of course it's necessary. It's always necessary to do what's right. And you can put a lot of passion and zeal behind the effort according to man. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. You want to see why the lawyers had a particular problem with this? Turn with me to Luke chapter 11. The setting of this verse, uh, the latter part of Luke chapter 11. Find verse 52 with me. But the setting of this is Jesus is reclining at dinner. I wish we could just do it. He's just... He's reclined, he's been invited to dinner at a Pharisee's house, and he's leaning, he's leaning his arms on the table, and he's in a discussion, and the discussion kind of goes awry because they, they comment, they notice he starts eating without, he's done something wrong. See, they're noticing these differences. It's not, is it, is it important to his heavenly father? No, but to the lawyer, it's real important, you know. I could, I could go into all kinds of questions I get asked, you know, about when I visit a church. You know one I'm hardly ever asked? Do they love each other? That's what Brother Zach said the same thing. That's where I first heard that from. Here, they, they notice he doesn't wash his hands, so he gets into a discussion, and it begins to be difficult a little bit. And so we come to this part in, in, in chapter 11, verse 52, and he says, Woe to you, lawyers, because you have taken away the key to knowledge. You didn't enter, and the ones in, trying to enter, you hindered. And it's interesting, they could not handle this. It says, and after saying this, the scribes and the, and the Pharisees began to be dreadfully hostile towards him. And I know if, you know, if you look in chapter 11, he says some very, very difficult things. And, but I do want to point out something about our Lord Jesus that, that I'd like you to notice. If Luke, the writer, interviewing a person said, and then the Pharisees who heard this, the lawyers who heard this, if they began to vehemently assail him at that point, don't you think that the same writer could have made the observation if that's how Jesus had been speaking to them? What if he was just saying, what would he do? Does he have to be yelling? You have to see Jesus. Do you see Jesus standing and pointing his finger and railing on people? I know he cleansed the temple. From the time he was 12 to the time he was 30, he'd, have, he'd been there three times a year. Every, every devout man in Israel, according to the law, had to be there three times a year for three feasts. 18 years times three, that's 54. Think of all the other times he could have been there. How many times he cleansed the temple? Once or twice at the most we have recorded. Think of all the times he was there. You want to make that your ministry? I'd much rather hear about the healing of people at the temple. He taught the people in the temple. But it does justify a lot of carnal zeal. I sure used it to justify a lot of my own carnal zeal. But the sobering thought, I, I had to ask the Lord. This one took me a while. The key to knowledge. He took away the key. They taken away the key to knowledge. What did they take away? I got to thinking. We read it. We read it. We read it in 1 Timothy. They, they missed the very end of the law. What's the end of the law? They missed the very thing that enables the law of God to be fulfilled. Love. And you know how he demonstrated this? Our Lord Jesus. He was at another table one time. This time he was reclining with his disciples. 
leaning against a table. And he knew that his hour had come, that he was about to leave the world and return to the Father. And having loved his own, it says, he loved them ta telos, to the goal. And what did he do? He got up from the table, and he took his clothes off, and he girded himself with a towel. And Judas was right there with the other eleven. And he began to wash his disciples' feet. Finished. Peter didn't understand what was going on. He had to say to them, you don't understand now, but you will one day. You call me Master and Lord, for thus I am. And if I, your Master and your Lord, has washed your feet, so you do unto one another. One another of the same kind. This is what you do. Because in the first, when the first covenant uh, that God gave through Moses, the law of righteousness there was, the man who does these things shall live by them. But Jesus says, now he's bringing about to institute a new covenant. And he says, now that ye know these things, blessed are ye if ye do them. A new commandment I give unto you. Love one another as I have loved you. And Paul saw it. Brothers, you've been called to liberty. Only use not your liberty as an occasion to the flesh, but in love serve one another. Because the person who loves his neighbor does him no wrong. When Jesus was asked what the greatest commandment was, remember? By a lawyer tested him with a question. He said, the first and greatest commandment is thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, all thy might, and all thy strength. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And then he says, on these hang all the law and the prophets. It's not, the, it's not a commandment in the law. Love is what the law hangs on. It's the one thing Israel Never got. And our Lord gives us a living demonstration of what love is. Because regardless of what any commandment there ever was, they are all fulfilled in this one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love doth no harm to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Can you see now why Paul said, For this reason I kneel before the Father from whom all heaven and earth derives its name. The family on heaven and earth derives its name. And this I pray that ye be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And ye being rooted and established. Where? In love, rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp what is the height and breadth and length and depth of the love of God and to know this love, which we already know from Paul, surpasses knowledge that you might be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. The key to being filled with, to the measure of all the fullness of God is simply this. The love of God shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Spirit. See, it's what the law could not do. Weak as it was to the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And he condemned sin in the flesh. And he became, he was a propitiation for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do what? 
who do not walk according to the flesh in that carnal, puffed up mind, trying to establish a righteousness by knowledge. It's a, an incomplete knowledge of God. Rather, we walk by the Spirit, empowered, being the very love of God, the very life of God. If a commandment had been given that could impart life, righteousness would have been by the law. But it takes the life of God to produce righteousness. And, the, and Jesus Christ is the life of God and the love of God. And when Christ is reigning in the heart, God, who is love, is abiding in a believer. And he ceases to do wrong to his neighbor when the love of Christ constrains him. He who abides in love abides in God and God in him. By this is love made perfect. This is how we have confidence in the day of judgment. You know what gives us confidence in the day of judgment? That being made perfect in love, we are as he is in this world. We do no harm to our brother or our neighbor. By God at work in us to will and to do of his good pleasure. What the law could not do, the very love of God being shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit can do and will do. We just simply need to help people find the simplicity of devotion to Christ. It's not so bright. Peter saw it. Seeing ye have purified your soul's by obeying the truth. That's really important, isn't it? Seeing that you have uh, purified your souls by obeying the truth. That's important. You realize it says unto? That's just to, that's just to get you started. Unto the unfeigned love of the brethren. Look at 1 Peter 4. 1 Peter 4. I, I wouldn't have you turn there. I just can't quote them all. I, w I wish I could. We're trying, Jose. First Peter chapter 4, verse 7. But the end of all things is at hand. Guys, we're in the last days. You know what the most important thing about the last days is? Lawlessness is going to increase. And you know what it's going to cause? It's going to, it's going to strike at the heart of the most vital thing God has ever placed in the world love because the love of the many is going to begin to wax cold and if if love is the fulfillment of the law how then can the righteousness of God ever be established if love is waxing cold here he said, the end of all things is drawn near. Be of sound mind, be self-controlled under prayers. And above all things, above all things, have fervent love. Why? What will love do? What will love do? It will cover a multitude of sins. Brother. You know what this took me back to, Brother Allen? It took me back to a time when there were three brothers and one father who had made a pretty serious error. And had too much to drink. Got hot. Took his clothes off and laid down for a nap. And the youngest brother, named Ham, came in and he saw his father's nakedness. And you know what he went out and did? All he did is he went out and he gave a factual report of what he saw to his brothers. You can make more of it if you want to. All, that's all the scripture tells us. That he went out and he told his brothers... And it's not what they said. It doesn't say they said a word to him. It says they lifted up a cover between the two of them and they backed in and preserved the honor of their father. I am driven to know the love of God in Christ Jesus because I am tired of dishonoring my father by actions that blaspheme the name of Jesus Christ. And the gospel of Jesus Christ. I believe it's possible in this life to be so full of the Holy Spirit. That you don't let any more unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. 
but only what is good for building others up according to the need and the minister's grace to the hearer. I, I know no man can tame the tongue. I'm not just a man. The Holy Spirit of God, Jesus Christ, dwells in me. And if, you get, if a man cannot even keep a tight rein on his tongue, his religion is, what does the Bible say? Worthless. Worthless, and you should throw it away. You know, if you would love life and see good days, what are we told to do? Put away perversity from your mouth. Keep corrupt talk far from your lips. Turn from evil and do good. Seek Peace and pursue it. How do you do that? You pursue the very love of God. Only the love of God makes this possible. You see, love is not puffed up. You can't puff love up. Love is kind. It vaunteth not itself. It is not rude. It seeks not its own. It always, it bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. Love never fails. Other things will pass away. Prophecy will pass away. Tongues will pass away. Knowledge, even knowledge will pass away. But these three things don't, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. What's the very next verse? Who can quote it? You know why we don't quote it very often? Because the chapter changes. Sometimes what they do is not very much a help to us. You know what the next verse, I used to think the next verse said in chapter 14, eagerly desire spiritual gifts. You know, that's not what it says at all. Right in front of that, Paul wasn't finished yet. These three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these things is love. Then he says, pursue love. Man, I just wish, you know, it says we should walk worthy of the calling we've received. In all uh, lowliness, meekness, long-suffering, forbearance, forgiving one another, gracing one another, endeavoring to preserve what? The unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. You see, everything God is wanting to do is to make us one. Isn't this what Jesus prayed? Father. Look, look with me. John chapter 17. Let's just see it together. John chapter 17. Verse 20. I do not pray the, for these alone, but for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, Father, as you are in me and I in you, that they may also be one in us in order that the world may believe you sent me. Do we want the people out there that we talk about so vehemently or the churches out there that we talk about so vehemently to see God with us? To believe that we were sent of God? What's going to make them believe we were sent of God? They see the incredible miracle of a diverse people being made. What is the bond of perfection? It's the only thing able to make us one. As, as elect of God, holy and beloved, put on bowels of compassion, kindness, uh, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing, all these things. If you have any complaint against one another, forgive as God and Christ forgave you. And above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Because it is so rare. It is so rare to see a group of diverse people actually become one. That even in the Old Testament, it says, behold, you better, watch, you better see it because it's so rare. Behold. 
Behold how good and blessed it is when brothers dwell together in unity. You think it's, you think it's a great work of God for you to walk in righteousness by yourself? When the scripture says none of us lives to himself alone. None of us dies to himself alone. What really is a dynamic work of God is when two are made one. God has glorified that. And it, see, when brothers dwell together in unity, it's like precious oil poured on Aaron's head, running down on the beard, running down on the collar of his robes as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion because there in the brothers dwelling together, for there the Lord commands a blessing. Even life evermore. How does this relate to revival conference? Back to this, please. You want to see the church cleaned up? You want to see your own family cleaned up? You want to see your own children converted? You need the power of God. God's not pouring. God's not pouring his Holy Spirit in a dirty vessel. If a man cleanses himself from the latter, he shall be a vessel of honor, sanctified, ready for use. Because he's not going in taking the contamination from his carnal mind. He's, he's made up his mind not to murmur or complain against a brother. That for the glory and honor of Christ, he would rather be wrong and to place a difference where God is trying to make a oneness. I'm not talking about allowance to sin because the audience I'm speaking to is concerned about doing righteousness. God knows our hearts in this matter. So it's be it began in my home. Not another unkind word to my wife. God won't let me be tempted above what I'm able to bear. I just take the way of escape. And even in this earthen vessel, it's going to become clear that the excellency of the power is the love of Christ constraining me, controlling my tongue, renewing my mind, and it's going to produce good fruit. And men are going to see good fruit. And through that fruit, they're going to taste the kindness of the Lord and be led to repentance. I've already seen it restore my family. I'm beginning to see it restore the, the families in the fellowship. Husbands and wives experiencing the, the very promises of God that you, my people shall live in peaceful dwelling places and undisturbed places of rest. For no matter how many promises God has made in Christ, they are yea and amen. And Christ is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think. And it's so incredibly simple, as contrasted with the people quoted all the time, the either the Ten Commandments or the, or the 636, something like that, commandments of the, of the Old Testament. I tell you what, the glory of the new is so much greater that, that what came with glory has no glory now in comparison because all it took for Jesus Christ to fulfill his entire covenant is one commandment. One. And all of our efforts should be towards being made perfect in the one commandment. And that will constrain us to pray as our brother calls us to pray. You know what drove him really to pray for his son? Love. 
Simple. You know what's burdening on his heart, calling him to pray for the church? Love. You know why? You know why people out there or any of us, it's simple. Why do we love the world? Or the things of the world? It's just an evidence that the love of the Father is not in us. How do you get the love of the Father in people? You know, what are you going to do? Put a bit and bridle on them? Make them come? I, Paul had a way of doing it. He preached the unsearchable riches of Christ. And he made much of his ministry in and hope to stir other people up to envy. And when you when you caught a vision of the glory of God in the face of Christ, when you have been forgiven much, what do you do? You love much. And then this loving much, once 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 your love for Christ and gets where it needs to be, your love for your brethren. You can't wait to tell others about him. And then suddenly, the things that you once thought gain become loss. You don't stand at the commode and wonder, maybe I should recycle this. Maybe it has something of other use. It's, all right, I'll give it up. You just haven't seen the glory of Christ. You just haven't seen. You see, Satan's strategy has not changed. It's very simple. The God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the glory of the goodness of God in the face of Christ. And you know who's supposed to be the light of the glory of God now? We are. How are they going to know what love looks like? All men will know that a disciple has become like his master. When you love one another like the master loved the disciple. That's how all men will know we're his disciples. That's what I was missing in my life. And that's what I believe if we're not careful. That we'll seek a revival by means of the law. And not by means of the love of God. Let's just pray about that.